Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to see this room kind of bustling with energy and people. Uh, we had to hold this uh, seminar series last year all remote, so it's great to see everyone, familiar faces, even behind the masks. I'm, I'm very excited to see you in newer faces as well. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone. This is our first uh, seminar of uh, the semester. We are delighted to be hosting Professor Sharad Goel from uh, Harvard University. He's a professor of public policy at the Kennedy School. Um, he's a truly prolific writer, and his research, research mainly deals with uh, brings in an equity lens on really important issues around policing practices and fair machine learning practices. Uh, he also is a terrific writer in kind of the more popular press. I've read his pieces in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, talking about statistical pitfalls around important policy issues. Always a pleasure to kind of read those uh, also in a more... Um, approachable way. Uh, before joining the Kennedy School, he was a professor at Stanford where he founded the Computational Policy Lab and uh, we've, uh, me and my students have been definitely consumers of some of that research and got uh, inspired by it. He holds a bachelor's degree in math from the University of Chicago and a master's in computer science and a PhD in applied math from Cornell. I actually have a PhD from the Kennedy School, so I'm delighted to be hosting a professor from there. And I'm also, this probably you don't know, uh, Sharad, I'm a dissertation advisor of one of your nemesis, Dean Knox. So uh, it, was, it was very fun when uh, kind of earlier in the day uh, during the lunch, uh, Devav Raj Shah brought up uh, the debate, the very active de debate, which is very exciting uh, with Dean Knox and his co-authors. So we, we're thrilled to host host you, uh, delighted to have you, uh, and very much look forward to hearing about uh, your topic today, which is going to be on designing equitable algorithms for criminal justice and beyond. So thank you for being here. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction. Just to be clear, I have no enemies. I love everybody. <laughs> so I just want to put that out there. Um, I, um, I'm also super excited to be here. This is the first in-person talk that I've given, I think, in two years. And so it's, uh, it's, it's fun to see so many people. I think it's actually the most people I've seen in a single room in, in two years, so, so quite exciting. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about a kind of wide variety of work that we've been doing over the last five or seven years um, that touch on, on ways to evaluate algorithms with this equity focus, um, principles for, you know, broader principles for evaluating these things in a variety of contexts, and uh, design principles that we've learned for, for building and deploying these types of tools. I'll try to keep this pretty informal, so feel free to ask questions throughout and, and happy to go off on tangents and, and continue the conversation. Um, so I want to start with a motivating example that's some work that we did last year on, on understanding racial disparities in automated speech recognition systems. This was um, a, a great interdisciplinary team of, of linguists, statisticians, computer scientists led by Allison Kanicki. Um, so automated speech recognition, as, as many of you likely know, this is, this is all over the place in our, in our phones. Um, it's not only a convenience, but it's used by many people to facilitate hands-free use of, of devices. It's really a life changer for a lot of folks. And, it's, um, and it's, it's taken off in the last you know, sort of five, 10 years with developments in, in deep learning and, and uh, much greater data collection. But there's a worry with this technology, as with much, many uh, forms of technology, that not all groups in the population are benefiting equally from, from these advances. Uh, so we went out to try to audit um, the five leading uh, ASR providers, automated speaker, speech recognition providers, Amazon, Apple, Google, IBM, and Microsoft, by comparing human and machine transcription of about 20 hours of audio. So we ran all, these, the, all this audio through, um, through these, these five recognizers and then compared it to ground truth human recognition and looked at these error rates. So what we found was a quite striking pattern. Um, this is average word error rate on the vertical axis. It's, it's a normal error rate. Um, I won't go into the precise details, but we can just think of it as, as any kind of error rate. Um, so lower is better here. And what we're seeing when we compare this, the corpus of black versus white speakers, we see this quite large gap. So even though kind of the average performance differs across these five recognizers, we see about a 2x gap between the, the uh, transcription accuracy for white speakers versus black speakers. 
Um, just to give you a sense of what this looks like, this is a typical transcription that's been edited. So the, so the um, black is what we get from the transcriber. This is for a, a, a typical error rate for a black speaker. The black is what we get out of the, transcri the transcription, the automated transcription, which has been corrected. I've overlaid it with the red, which is editing what the correct version is. And you see this is a lot of error. You know, it's to the point where it's quite hard to understand what's going on if you just were to read that black text without the editing. So this really is not like we're, we're we're saying, oh, it's 2x, but it's all really good. It's the difference between being usable and being not really usable. So we see quite large disparities. Now, the systems underlying, and in, in, in I'm, I'm I kind of speaking at a high level now, these systems tend to operate uh, both with a, a language model trying to capture the grammar and predicting the next word from text, and also an acoustic model. And so we evaluated both of these aspects of the automated speech recognition, recognition systems to try to understand what is going on underneath the hood. And what we found is that it's really the acoustic models that are suffering. The language models actually work comparably across um, uh, black and white speakers, but the acoustic models were really not um, functioning well at all. And the one way that we, we saw this is we found we had enough of a, of a corpus, about 20 hours of speech, that we could find identical phrases, short phrases, that were spoken by white and black speakers. And we looked at that, that corpus of identical phrases. We saw even on that identical, those identical phrases where you can ignore the words that are being used, they're, they're, they're the same thing, we still see about this 2x difference in error rates. And so again, there's some evidence that is, that is pointing to the acoustic models, not the underlying language models in, uh, that, that are driving these disparities. Okay, so to again, better understand who is impacted by these error rates, like who is impacted by this worst performance, um, we focused in on speakers of African American vernacular English. This is a, a form of English, technically linguists call this a variety of English, um, that's spoken by, in some form, by about 12% of Americans, so it's a quite large uh, variety, a popular variety of, of, of English in the United States. And we counted AV, um, African American vernacular English linguistic features in a random sample of audio snippets. So these include both grammatical features and also phonological uh, features. In so the grammatical features are things like zero copula, um, the construction they gone, for example, as opposed to they are gone, um, the future be, so he be here tomorrow. These are characteristic of, of av constructions. We also looked at um, uh, common uh, phonological features of av, so for example, final consonant cluster reduction, band, uh, uh, being pronounced as ban, um, and what's called apology, Mississippi, being pronounced as Mississippi. And so these types of, of uh, phonological features were also tagging in, in our corpus. Um, when we do this, we again see this quite striking relationship. And so on the, on the uh, horizontal axis, this is roughly speaking the proportion of of the snippet that contains at least one of these, or the proportion of, of, of the snippet that contains these, these types of features. And in the vertical axis is the average word error rate. And so what we see here in snippets with more of these grammatical and phonological features, really it's the phonological ones that are driving the error rates, but here I'm combining them. The ones that contain more of these, these features that are characteristic of AV um, are exhibiting the higher error rates. So again, it's, it's pointing to these disparities that are, that are felt by large segments of the population, particularly those um, who are using more of these features that are associated with F. Okay, so what can we do? Um, I think there's a lot we can do here. So the, the you know, perhaps simplest is, is simply to collect more diverse training data, not only for AV speech, but for uh, a, a variety of forms of, of English. Um, uh, I think this is actually one of these problems where in, in some sense it's straightforward to solve. So I think we can, in, you know, we can we, for my, my point estimate is a you know, relatively small amount of resources, we can go out and carefully collect more data, annotate these things, use that to train these models, and we can, in a relatively short period of time, see these things improve. It's not like we need new science. I think we just need a little bit of elbow grease to collect more data. So I think that's probably the first place to start. Um, uh, it, it also points to this lack of inclusion in this broader community of folks that are that are developing these tools. Um, what we did was from the outside, it was kind of 
pretty hard, kind of laborious to, to carry out the study, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like we had to, again, invent new science to carry this out. Any user um, of these systems would immediately recognize that this was a problem. I mean, my own experiences um, it with my, oop, am I, something is happening with my email. Out. Um, so uh, uh, my, my own experience is I remember um, having these kind of uh, uh, voicemail transcriptions from my parents 10, 15 years ago that is totally garbled. It's like it's, it's really kind of casual use of these products will quickly reveal that these disparities are, 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 are real and large. And I think a lack of, of diversity in this, in this community um, has, has let these types of disparities persist. So again, something that's structural that we can change. Um, I, I hope that uh, we can regularly assess and report progress over time, both external researchers, but also internally from the, from the folks that are developing these systems. In many cases, that's, uh, that's a, st a relatively straightforward thing that one can do on the inside. And finally, learning from algorithmic and legislative progress made in other domains, for example, computer vision, where there's stricter regulation, both at the municipal level and, and even nationally, there's a conversation about how we should enforce um, uh, uh, development of these types of tools that are not just being used in kind of by private businesses, but are being used by government agencies and a wide variety of, of actors. So it's not just kind of a niche product at this point. It's really something that's entering courtrooms and, and it, it's becoming an integral part of our, our lives. Okay, so this is just kind of one motivating example of work that we've done to help audit these types of, of systems. So now I want to point out that even though I would say that this type of analysis looking at these error rates across groups was relatively successful, um, it, it, that general framework has not been so successful in, in many other domains. And the reason for that is a relatively subtle uh, statistical issue that I'm going to discuss now. And so broadly, I'm going to offer a critique of what are what I term deontological approaches to fairness. It's kind of a highfalutin term. I'll define it in a minute, coming from the philosophy literature, um, that is characterized the vast majority of, of, the, of the progress that's been made in the computer science community, at least. And so I'm going to offer a broad critique of this. But I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm not going to say everything is lost. I'll come back and offer. Um, a positive perspective of how I think we can move forward in this, uh, what I call a consequentialist um, point of view. So first to critique. So this is, um, this is actually, so I'm, I'm going to highlight one paper here with Sam Corbett Davies um, that, that articulates this argument. But this is really a culmination of a lot of what we've been thinking about over the last several years with many, many um, collaborators. OK, so um, as, as you all know, uh, uh, risk assessment is common in a variety of domains. High stakes decisions are, are, in many cases, either with statistical models or with kind of intuitive human judgment, are made by estimating the, the likely effect of some intervention. Um, landing is based on the risk of default. Pretrial detention is based on the risk of recidivism. And the idea, at least the hope, the optimistic hope, is that by using statistically, empirically guided risk assessment tools, um, we can, in theory, be more efficient, more consistent, and more equitable. Now, the reality, of course, is more complicated, but this is the, the hope. Um, now, what do I mean by deontological ethics? So here, the morality of an action is, is based on whether or not that action itself is wrong or right under some set of rules rather than the consequences of that action. So that's all I mean by this deontological ethics. And we'll see some examples of this, of, of how I'm applying this to this algorithmic fairness world. But roughly, we think of an action as inherently right or wrong as opposed to being right or wrong conditional on what happened because we took this action. Okay. So the way I'm thinking about this in terms of error rates is we're saying, well, error rates, the fact that error rates differ across groups, I don't care what that means in the world. I'm saying that itself is not a good thing. And we saw a version of that when we were looking at this automated speech recognition. You know, that inherently, I think to many of us, we would agree, that feels wrong. It's like, why do we have these tools with different performance across groups? We're not saying you know, these groups, because of x, y, and z, because they couldn't use these devices in certain ways, or, or looking at the direct consequences of those differences in error rates. We're saying the fact that these error rates themselves are, are, uh, uh, differ across groups is an inherent wrong. 
Okay, and I am going to say that while this makes a lot of intuitive sense, it's actually deeply problematic in a subtle statistical um, uh, way that I'll try to explain. Okay, so again, using this idea, I'm gonna start with this, this idea of error rates that we've been exploring. So an algorithm, this definition, or one very popular definition in the computer science community, is that an algorithm is considered to be fair, quote unquote fair, if error rates are approximately equal and for simplicity, I'll have two groups, white and black individuals. You can generalize this, of course, but I'll try to keep things quite concrete. Um, uh, this is not only a definition of fairness that has uh, been popularized in the computer science community. It's really having impact in the broader legislative world. This is language that was from a, um, a proposed, uh, proposed legislation in Idaho talking about pretrial risk assessment algorithms, saying that they shall not be used by the state until first shown to be free of bias, meaning that an algorithm has been formally tested and that the rate of error is balanced as between the protected classes and those not in protected classes. So again, this deontological view is not saying these are, you know, these algorithms that cause harm in some way are, are, are not to be used. It's that algorithms that have these disparate um, error rates are not to be used, okay? Um, and this requirement, just to note, was, was removed from the final bill in part for, I think, some of these issues that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Okay, so now even error rate is not a universal concept. There are many different types of error rates. What I'm gonna talk about generalizes to essentially any form of error that, that uh, we can imagine, anything that you can compute from a confusion matrix, any you know, AUC, all these notions of error, this, will, this broad critique that I'm gonna offer applies to, but I'm specifically going to talk about false positive rate. This is a very popular form of error that is, that is showing up in the computer science community, and um, uh, I, so I'll, I'll just keep everything here, but please note that everything generalizes. So what is a false positive rate? It's saying um, among those, I'm gonna talk about this pretrial setting to get, keep things really quite concrete. So false positive rate in that setting means among people who ultimately do not go on to reoffend, the proportion that are deemed high risk by the algorithm. Among people who do not ultimately go on to reoffend, the proportion that are deemed high risk by the algorithm. Okay, so this is what I mean by error rate and false positive rate in particular. So if you look at the ProPublica data, ProPublica, I suspect many of you have, have seen a version of this. It was a very popular um, uh, investigative journalism piece written I think about five years ago um, by, by ProPublica and they came out with these quite striking statistics. So they looked at folks who were scored in Broward County, Florida. They also looked at recidivism. And they, what they found is this startling disparity between error rates of, of black and white defendants. So in particular, among black defendants who ultimately did not reoffend, about a third, 31% were deemed high risk by this, the tool that was used in that jurisdiction called Compass, um, versus about 15% of white defendants who do not ultimately reoffend being deemed high risk by the algorithm. So this quite large disparity, both in relative terms, a 2x difference, and also in absolute terms, a 15 percentage point difference. This is quite a large thing. The first time I saw these um, numbers, I was like, oh, well, somebody messed up. You know, this was like clearly they didn't, you know, didn't design this algorithm well. You know, clearly something is, 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 is going on here. Um, what I'm gonna to try to argue now that it's much more subtle and that this like visceral reaction that I suspect many of us feel in this room is, is um, there's a lot more going on and that and I'm gonna to try to persuade you in the next 10, 10 minutes or so that we shouldn't take these types of numbers to mean exactly what we initially might interpret them to mean. Okay, so well, these are the pictures. I know it's late in the day, so it's, uh, it's always easier to think in, think in pictures. Uh, we're gonna have two groups here. We have our blue group, we have our orange group. Um, uh, we have, the, they're sorted by their probability of reoffense. For sake of this simple, uh, simple example, I'm going to assume that these are real numbers. These are exact probabilities of reoffending conditional on the observed covariance. So it's not that I'm an oracle and I know who's gonna reoffend and who's not gonna reoffend, conditional on the observed uh, covariates. Imagine you're a frequentist, you have lots and lots of data. We have conditional on the observed covariates, we can compute the probability of reoffense, and that's what these numbers are. Here, again, I'm assuming we're in a perfect world, not because I believe we're in a perfect world, but I wanna say even in this idealized perfect world, things still go wrong. 
Okay, so we have no reason to believe that in the imperfect world, all of a sudden, this type of argument will fall apart. So I want to make the kind of strongest argument I can make and say, let's assume everything is perfect. So part of this means that I'm assuming we have perfect observation of the outcome. I'm trying to predict recidivism, so I know when someone is offended. It's not that I know when someone is arrested or convicted. I actually know when they offended. In the real world, we don't know that. But here, we're going to assume conditional on covariates. I know exactly the probability of that adverse outcome that I care about. Okay, so we have these two groups. So here are the low, uh, the, uh, the low risk folks on the left side, 10%, 20%. The high risk folks on the right side, 70%, 80%, 90%. We have um, uh, two different groups of people. If I have any two different groups of people, you know, non-random split, I expect a different distribution of risk. If I look at the risk at MIT, the risk at Harvard, I probably have different risk distributions. Hopefully they're both low, but two different groups of people will have two different risks distributions. And so here, I expect to see the exact same thing. Um, now this vertical line here is saying where I'm going to draw the line for deeming people to be high risk. And so if I'm going to make a binary choice, and in many of these cases I have to make a binary choice, I'm either going to release somebody or I'm going to detain them, you know, something like this. So I have to make some binary choice. Well, one way to do that is to draw a line, deem people to be high risk on one side, low risk on the other, and I take some appropriate action. Okay? Uh, so this is what this, this picture is saying. And, and the fact that I've drawn this line, um, you know, there, there's not a unique way to make decisions. Conditional risk scores, I can do whatever I want to do. The statistical estimation problem is distinct from the policy problem. This is the way that many jurisdictions do it. Arguably, it's the most natural. It's, it's efficient in some you know, specific sense of the word. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's legal. Many, if I had multiple thresholds across groups, that would almost certainly be illegal. And so this it has nice kind of attraction properties of saying that we're going to treat all individuals the same based on their risk score. Okay, that's, that's the intuition behind this type of picture. Now let's see what goes on here. Um, let's just again do this in pictures. We want to compute the false positive rate for the blue group. How do we do this? We look at you know, people who do not reoffend, and we see how many of them are deemed high risk to the right of the line. Um, I'm just going to you know, again do this, do this by you know, simulation roughly. We say, okay, look, we have five people who reoffend in red. That means we have eight people in blue who do not reoffend. Of those eight people, two of them are to the right of the dashed line. We have a false positive rate of 25%. This isn't, if you follow that argument, it's not exactly right, but the, the end result is, is correct. Okay? So now we're going to do the same thing with the orange group. So now this is a higher risk group on average. So this shifted to the right. That means more people will reoffend. That means fewer people will not reoffend. The way I've drawn this picture, of those people who do not reoffend, more of them lie to the right of this line. So I end up with a false positive rate of 42%. Okay? So here we have these two different groups. They have different risk distributions. We've treated them fair in kind of a conventional legal policy way. We get differences in error rates. I, I gave this argument for false positive rates. I can repeat it for, for any other common statistic of error. Yes, please. Use line on left and all rates or whatever they are, like right. Just, uh, yeah, exactly. So this argument here, you know, this I, I did it in this in this case, you can pretty see immediately. This is what I did in pictures. It's not like you need to prove some big theorem here. You can come up with these types of, you know, ex this is the norm, not the exception. Anytime you have differences in the distribution. Um, so that was a fictitious example. If we go back to the Broward County example, um, we see differences in estimated uh, um, rates of reoffense. So here we don't see the real we don't know really conditional on covariates what is the rate of recidivism. We don't know the actual outcome. You know, there are all sorts of issues here, but we can at least estimate it given the observed data. And what we see here is a heavier tail for black defendants who are scored relative to white defendants who are scored. By this argument that I just gave before, we have this higher, this shifted risk distribution. We would expect to see a higher error rate. Okay. So this is what's called um, uh, the problem of inframarginality, what we call the problem of inframarginality. This is an idea that's been floating around the economics literature for a while. It hasn't always like, picked up 
um, steam and in, in, in this type of argument, but we've seen this come up when we, we first saw this come up when we started looking at, at um, bias, the difficulty of measuring discrimination in human decisions, and then realize that exactly the same phenomenon could affect the analysis of algorithms. So what is the idea of, of inframarginality? It's saying that the statistic in all error rate statistics really require integrating over the risk distribution, the underlying risk distribution. But our notions of fairness typically revolve around some threshold and treating similarly risky people similarly. So these are really two incompatible notions of, of fairness. And this idea of, of drawing a threshold, I would say this is, again is the one that historically has been applied. It, it makes a lot of sense from, from various different um, perspectives, including kind of efficiency, including individual fairness. But it's at odds with this idea that we're going to integrate over an entire distribution, which, in, which creates these problems of inframarginality. So at a statistical level, that's where this is happening. So you might say, OK, I get it. There's some statistical issues here. But still, it just feels wrong. You know, there's still this like, strong deontological push. There's something wrong about having these error rates that are, that are so different across groups. So I want to still push on that intuition. Um, so here's our, our high false positive rate group. This is our group with 42% false positive rate. This is a high false positive rate group. We're really like unhappy about this. Our blue group had 25% false positive rate. So what are we going to do? How are we going to fix things here? Well, one thing we can do is we can go out and arrest a bunch of college protesters. Obviously, I'm being facetious. We're not going to go out and arrest a bunch of college protesters. But let's see what happens if you were to do this. If you go out, so clearly we're making this group worse off. We've arrested a bunch of college protesters. Um, they're low risk people. The algorithm knows that they're low risk. But, if you, but most of them will end up in the denominator. And all of a sudden, your error rate calculation gives you a 25% false positive rate. So we went from this situation where we're like, this feels wrong. This feels like this orange group is really suffering to this situation where if we looked at the false positive rates, everything looks fine. But really, we've clearly made the orange group worse off. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is not one of incentives. It's not that if we were to only focus on false positive rates and we create an incentive to shift the distribution in this way. The point, rather, is that you care about the distribution. You have to understand the distribution in order to make sense of these types of statistics. Okay, so again, these are highly distributionally dependent statistics, even though our notions of fairness often don't care about the distribution. They care about these principles of treating similarly risky people similarly, which is inherently a distribution-free notion of equity. Again, it's not the only notion of equity, but I'd say one that has um, a legal history, a policy history, a optimization history. It's one that, that I think many of us can, can attach to. Um, so now what's going on here? Why is this like a broad critique of machine learning? We know many of us, we like write these papers, myself included, where we compute error rates across um, a variety of classifiers. And we're like, this is, you know, look at my paper. I, I beat X, Y, and Z. Therefore, we should publish it, right? So this is, so it's not a broad critique of that style of work. And why is it not a broad critique of that? I, because there's a subtle difference in the standard ML pipeline and what we just saw. So in a standard ML pipeline, you have a bunch of models, a bunch of classifiers. You have your state-of-the-art competitors. You have your new fancy model. And you have one test data set. And you compare all of these candidates on this test data set. And you look at the model that performed the best. That's kind of the, the outline of an ML performance paper. What's happening here? We have one model, not multiple models. We have one model, and we have multiple test data sets, not a single test data set. So we've gone standard ML, multiple models, one test data set to this fair ML world where it's multiple models, or it's one model, multiple test data sets. So what are the multiple test data sets? These are the different groups. And so now it's an apples to oranges comparison. That if I were to say, well, we're evaluating this model on this group and the same model on another group, the fact that they perform differently is not telling us that much about how the model itself operates. It's also confounded with the difficulty of the underlying problem. And it turns out that in many of these cases, a higher base rate is going to lead to a higher uh, false positive rate. And so again, this doesn't mean we should ignore error rates. But it means that we really have to think carefully when we're trying to interpret these in these types of standard risk assessment settings. 
Um, so again, I want to like highlight this point that in speech recognition, these error rates were quite meaningful. But why were they meaningful there? It's because we have outside knowledge, domain knowledge, that these problems aren't inherently harder. It's not that it's harder to, you know, inherently harder to detect um, uh, transcribed speech from white speakers versus black speakers. You know, we have kind of linguistics community telling us that these are actually more or less computationally the same problem. And so the fact that we see differences in error rates is suggestive of other problems in the pipeline, for example, not having representative training data. But in these risk assessment settings, whenever I have differences in base rates, you know, this is which is the norm, not the exception, I have different difficulty of problem. When I have a difference in base rates, that means definitely I have a difference in distribution. If I have a difference in distribution, one problem is gonna be easier than the other, and then I'm gonna see these types of differences in error rates. Okay, yes? Maybe it's a question related to both of the examples you have presented. First one is the speech recognition, second one is this. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, in the second case, as you correctly pointed out, that having different algorithms for different groups has potentially legal implications. In the first case, I mean, I could have two different algorithms for two different groups. Uh, so clearly there's something going on here, right? There's, depending on the context, whether you want one algorithm or multiple algorithms. Um, so, so when you say multiple algorithms, you mean different thresholds, for example? For example, in the case of your thing, I would say, suppose I declared that, hey, I'm, I'm one with Indian accent, which I have, uh, then maybe the underlying speech recognition system would pick up more than three for people like me. Yeah, so again, this is a little bit of a complicated question, and there's, it, it, so it depends when is it problematic to have different algorithms for different groups. And so government agencies um, have their constitutional protections from making decisions that are, that are uh, conscious to things like race, gender, disability status, national origin. Um, usually, like in this example in the speech recognition, it's probably not the case that you would implement it by saying, tell me your race or ethnicity. You would probably learn it from a feature of the data and say, well, based on this, we are gonna apply this algorithm for, versus that algorithm. So there's nothing um, inherent about the protected attribute that's being used directly to, to, to use different types of classifiers there. This is a question, but I'm trying to understand the message from the uh, risk assessment example. So it seems to me that when you have a distribution which is centered towards higher risk, you are going to get a higher um, post concentration. And so it seems to me that that actually is reasonable. Is it's what? It's reasonable, mm -hmm. right? And so the question is, why did we have to fix it? Like, what we, you know, are, you know, see, right? I mean, I didn't understand the reason why you added these college cases in there, and how did you get to see, you know, to, to know what the ratio? Uh, um, so, I, so I'm saying we don't, so I'm, I think uh, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is we don't fix it by saying that these, these numbers are telling us about disparities. The college example was, again, not, I am not at all suggesting we go out and invest college students. I wanna make sure that's, that's on the record. Um, uh, what I was pointing out by that facetious example is that if we don't care about the underlying distribution, we're gonna interpret these statistics in funny ways. So the point exactly is differences in distributions, differences in base rates will lead to differences in error rates. So therefore, looking at error rates and concluding there's an inherent problem in the algorithm is a spurious argument in many cases. So I'm saying that because I got differences in the false positive uh, estimates, that doesn't necessarily mean that the algorithm is a has problems. It may imply, and it does imply, that the underlying distribution. Is yeah, so I wouldn't say it implies that the underlying distribution is different. It could be, yes. And so again, this is what I'm, I think many of us probably feel. We looked at those error rates, and even after this discussion, I'm willing to bet you know, some people are still like feeling, oh, there's something deeply problematic with this, this gap in error rates. And that is what I call this like, deontological perspective to this problem, that it's not about the consequences, it's not about who is harmed, it's about just like feeling that this gap shouldn't be there. And this is what I'm pushing against, this like kind of broad critique of, of much of the computer science literature over the last five years or so has been oriented towards this style of reasoning where we lay down a specific notion of, of fairness, a mathematical notion of fairness, 
that's irrespective of the consequences, and then we conclude something about the equity of those systems. And this is, again, I'm, I'm pushing back against that type of analysis. Yes? So then what, are you suggesting that a fair error rate calculation would be something where the algorithm is a complex function of both the distribution as well as the threshold? Yeah, so, so now so I think this is a great segue. So what can we do? I don't want to leave you hanging here and say this is, we can't do anything. None of these statistics mean anything. So let me actually, given the, in the interest of time, let me skip the second example that I was going to show you about another um, deontological way of, of, uh, of thinking about this. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm going I'm to jump to what I think is a, is a often useful, not universal, but often useful way of thinking about these types of problems. Um, so this is what I call a consequentialist approach to fairness, and I'll explain more about what that means in a minute. Um, this is, again, we've articulated this you know, approach in some ways in, in many papers. Um, uh, this is probably the clearest articulation, and this is work that's led by uh, Alex Chillis Wood and, and Madison Coots. Um, okay, so again, I want to switch the motivating example a little bit, but you can, you can think of this in, in, this, like, in, in many, many broader contexts. Um, so when people uh, fail to appear at their court dates, then they, they're at risk of incarceration uh, uh, because typically what's called a bench warrant is issued when you fail to meet that court date. And then if you're arrested for or, or stopped for a minor traffic violation or any other, any other um, police contact, often a warrant search will be done and then you'll be incarcerated, um, arrested and incarcerated. And so one way to uh, reduce this type of incarceration is to help people get to court by providing them um, with door-to-door -door rideshare service. One big barrier, it's not like people are trying to flee the country when they miss their court dates. It's just that you know, they didn't have, um, have, a, have a way to get to court. They had childcare issues. They didn't remember that this was on this time. They couldn't get time off of work. There are all these kind of laundry lists of relatively you know, understandable reasons that people can't make it to court. One big reason is that people don't have transportation services. So we interviewed a bunch of people and um, like others determined that this was one big barrier that folks faced. Now I want to point out the real solution to this problem is not to provide people with rideshare. It's to change this entire system so that people don't have to take off an entire day of work to show up for a 10-minute hearing, which is mostly perfunctory and doesn't actually require them to be there. And so that is what I think we should be moving to. That's obviously a larger political lift, although we have seen some movement there. It's a larger political lift. And so what we're focusing on now in partnership with a public defender is to help their clients get to court. But I don't want people to lose sight of that this is really a fix. It's a bandage to the problem, not the solution to the problem. Um, OK, so again, this motivating example, this is, this is uh, our real life um, problem that we're, that we're tackling. We have uh, roughly $100,000 to run a pilot study to purchase rideshare trips for people with upcoming court dates. If we can uh, figure out a, a good way to allocate these resources and you know, what does good mean and we have to figure out who to give these rides to, if we do this, then the county potentially will fund this indefinitely. Okay, so there's this big problem of how do we allocate limited transportation budget. So this is roughly enough to say cover 10% of people who have a need for, for this type of rideshare benefit. How do we allocate those resources in a way that is broadly equitable, whatever this, whatever this means? Now, one natural approach is to take kind of a pure optimization. This is you know, arguably what you might have done 10 years ago, where you say we're going to maximize the number of people who make it to court. You know, that is our goal. We have a certain amount of money. We want to look, these are counterfactuals. We want to say, had we uh, not given anybody this money versus if we give them this money in various different ways, we want to counterfactually increase the number of people that go to, that make it to court by the most. So how do you do this? Again, in theory, it's very straightforward. We estimate heterogeneous treatment effects. We estimate what is the causal effect for every person for giving them this rideshare benefit. We rank them and, um, and allocate by estimated effect per dollar. Okay, just statistically, it's hard. Statistically, like, I'm not saying it's easy to estimate these heterogeneous treatment effects. I'll talk about this at the end. But conceptually, it's very straightforward. We, we just estimate the effect of giving somebody a ride per dollar. We give it to the people who we see the most benefit for, and we're done. Okay, so this is maybe what we would have done 10 years ago. Now, what is the problem with this approach? Well, this is what um, Santa Clara County looks like. Uh, 
includes San Jose, like many major cities in, in the United States, it's a highly segregated um, region. This is a map. Each of these points here represents an individual. Um, and in the colors are the uh, self-identified uh, race or ethnicity of that individual. And what we see here is, is, is extreme segregation. Now, the court, um, the courthouse, if I remember correctly, is right around here. And so if you were to take this approach that I just described, you know, roughly you can think of distance to the court as being proportional to cost. Um, if you were to do that, who are you going to give these rides to? You're going to give the rides you know, roughly to the people down here. Okay, that is an optimal allocation of this limited resource if my objective is only to increase the number of people who show up to court. And that's not a bad objective. Right? If you were to like, say the first thing that comes to your mind of what you want to do with this resource, you'd say, get the most people to court. Like, that is not a crazy thing to do. But you look at this, all of a sudden I think it gives us pause. So, well, what if we only give those rides to one demographic subgroup in the population? That doesn't feel great. Uh, so now, so again, this like deontological approach, like one way of addressing this problem is we want to require that an equal proportion of rights are given to various groups of the population, maybe defined by race, by neighborhood, by other socioeconomic you know, status. This is one deontological approach. We can say, here's my constraint. And we can solve this. If we say, here's my constraint, it's now a standard constraint optimization problem, we can solve it. There's nothing computationally difficult. There's statistically it's difficult, computationally it's easy, and now conceptually though, is this what we want to do? Is this what we do? Do we want to solve this constraint optimization? Now implicit in this norm, in this rule, is a trade-off, which is often goes unstated. And this is where the consequences come in. So, and these are hypothetical numbers. If we were to do a pure optimization, you know, for our budget, maybe we get 1,000 new appearances, but 30% of one group gets rides and 10% of another. Again, just hypothetically, we're gonna put this out there. If we were to follow this equal allocation rule, we're almost certainly gonna have fewer people, extra people make it to court. Why is that? Because now it's a constraint optimization. We're not saying spend the money in the way to get the most people to court. We're saying spend the money to get the most people to court given that you're gonna do at least this thing of equal allocation. So there is a trade-off. That is not something you can get around. If you give me an extra constraint, almost never is it gonna be the case that you're gonna solve your original optimization problem. And so you get fewer people coming to court, but you have the trade, the benefit is you have equal allocation. So this isn't necessarily a bad thing to do, but my concern is that this is often implicit in these types of rules. So if somebody said, here's my rule, I want you to do the, do the best thing you can do, conditional on equal allocation, where does that come from? Where does the normative power of that rule come from if you don't look at the consequences of it? You know, let's say I went extreme and I said, well, it's not 800, you're actually only getting at 100 people to show up. Now all of a sudden, this doesn't feel like it's in the realm of, of what we want to do. Okay, so there is a trade-off. This might not, this still might be the right thing to do, but there is a trade-off that often goes unstated in these types of problems. Um, so here, so Yan just like kind of encapsulating what I just said, these deontological approaches to equity don't consider the consequences of these rules. You know, the, for example, they're not considering the consequences of equalizing error rates, the consequences of, of equalizing the allocation and benefits. They're really agnostic to the consequences. And what we advocate for is one that explicitly looks at utility. Now, the, the outcomes themselves, they care about the outcomes. Um, so here you can have these two extremes, maximizing appearances. You might have equal allocation on the other end. This is a simplified depiction of what you might care about. And maybe the stakeholder is somewhere in between. We're not saying don't care about equal allocation, but really be explicit about what you care about. Because if you're not explicit about that, if you just put a rule down, something is gonna happen, but you might not be happy with the outcome. And my argument is that in fact, most of the time, you won't be happy with the outcome because who knows what that outcome was if you didn't optimize with that thing in mind. Okay, so again, in pictures, how can we think about this? We can think of having a Pareto frontier over two dimensions. Again, this simplified picture where we have the number of additional appearances on one axis. We have the proportion of people in a target group receiving transportation on the other axis. And now we have a curve of optimal benefit 
um, this Predo frontier that we can sketch out. This, again, is a hard curve to, to um, uh, infer from the data, but in theory it exists. So all these points are within budget. Here is some policy that we might enact. We don't really like that policy because we could get more people to court and keep the demographic composition of the people who, who um, uh, uh, receive this benefit the same. These points on the outside of that curve are out of budget. We might want to be there, but we can't given our limited budget. Now here, let's look at what happens when we try to optimize for these different places. If we only look at maximizing appearances, we're going to have this point the crest of the curve. If we look at demographic parity, we have a different point over here. Again, this is, this is going to be, a, this is different in general from this point over here. Where we actually want to sit is likely somewhere in between. We don't know where that point is. It's again a difficult problem to know where we want to sit, but at least we can be explicit about it and choose it with intention. Um, if we did random allocation, you know, we're going to end up again with demographic parity, but far below the curve. If we were to equalize error rates in this particular example, we would end up here, close to demographic parity. Again, putting out these outside constraints, we can say we're just going to sit on the curve. We just can't tell you where you're going to be. And if you just throw down this deontological rule for what you want your algorithms to satisfy without thinking about the consequences, you can lie in parts of this space where you're actually very unhappy. Okay, so again, that is the punchline here that we have to look at consequences when we're making many of these high stakes decisions. Um, in general, again, you don't really need to prove a theorem here and for almost any example, you're gonna be suboptimal by this definition of, of, of optimality. If you give me a utility and you add a constraint, you're almost never going to satisfy that original unconstrained utility. Um, um, and now I wanna kind of, if, if you've been wondering, this is all quite conceptual, how do you do this in practice? So in practice, we want to efficiently learn a policy that maximizes our, our utility. It, you can think of this as a um, as something like a bandit, a contextual bandit problem with budgets, where in an inner loop, we are solving an optimization problem at each step. So in this case, we can write down the internal optimization problem as a linear program. So basically, we're running UCB with a, with a, with a linear program underneath that, that does both the exploration and also the optimization. So I know that was probably a bit jargony for, for folks who are not super into this world, but I at least wanted to throw that out there for, for those who are interested in, and you can check out the paper where we explain that in, in more detail. Yes? One of the issues uh, about having this kind of utilitarian consequentialist framework is we have multiple stakeholders, right? Yeah. So does it make sense to say there is a single objective function that underlies kind of the trade-offs, or is it some bargaining process between stakeholders? Yeah, I think it's a really... I think it's a really, really good question. Um, so we have run experiments, and we see heterogeneity in opinions across people, and which is not at all unexpected. In fact, it would be shocking if that were not the case. And so what do you do? And so in some sense, this is more a framework for thinking about these problems rather than saying this is an algorithm for solving these problems. And I, but the kind of broader critique is there is no real solution to this. Like think, like for me, I think of, of, of legislative reform. You know, we're not going to say, well, you know, a fair piece of legislation satisfies X, Y, and Z. We're going to have to go through some negotiation, decide what our kind of community values are, what we want to accomplish, and that's it. But somehow in the algorithmic world, we have convinced ourselves that we can prove theorems to establish equity. And I'm, of course, I'm, I'm proving theorems too. I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, smacking down on the computer science community. I'm part of that community. So I hope that's taken with, with a grain of salt here. But I think this is the issue here that, that we've, that in any normal policy problem, we would never think we could just like put these rules down and evaluate it. But we're always going to be in this hard situation. We don't know how to. Mindset is somehow more flexible in terms of the outcome of this bargaining process for different stakeholders as opposed to this where you are putting particular weights on these different objectives, would that be defensive? Of the deontological approach. I would, I would say actually the deontological approach is much less flexible. And now all of a sudden you have to say, well, here is, I mean, this is my line in the sand. I want this thing to be satisfied. And I, again, for me, it's very hard to say, well, why do I want this thing to be satisfied? It's when there's, when there's no external argument for saying I want equal proportion or I want equal false negative rates in this case. I mean, these are just things that we can say we want, but how do we decide between them if we don't think about the consequences?
So it's, I think it's, it's very hard to, to argue or debate with these deontological perspectives. Now that it's easy thinking about these consequentialist perspectives, if I show you this curve and I say, well, where do you want to sit on this curve? Extremely difficult. And again, we've run experiments where we try to infer where people want to sit on this curve. And people, as expected, have a variety of opinions. We still have to pick a point at the end of the day. Um, OK, so now um, in the last two minutes, I just want to give you a small um, example. We've been talking a lot about prediction. And I, I don't want to lose, a sight, uh, uh, lose, um, uh, lose sight of the fact that there are many algorithms that are non-predictive that are still like, quite important when we're in, in, these, in these equity conversations. Um, so I'll uh, show you some work that is recent um, that was led by Alex chillis -Wood and, and and others. Um, uh, so here we developed a natural language processing tool to automatically ras mask race-related information from police reports. Why did we do this? Um, district attorneys read these reports when making their initial charging decisions. So they charge about 50% of cases that are brought to them by the police. If they decide not to pursue a case for all intents and purposes, it never happened. Um, if they do decide to proceed with the case, then you enter the like full criminal legal system and all sorts of consequences stem from that. So in the jurisdictions uh, that we're working with, this initial decision is made almost entirely based on that police report. There's a worry about both implicit and explicit bias when making decisions based on, on these um, free text reports. And so we are masking race-related information from, uh, uh, from those reports. So let me give you a toy example. This is, this is completely hypothetical, but it, it captures the features that, that are important in this redaction. Um, so here are all these kind of sensitive terms, the, the names, uh, explicit descriptions of race, other physical descriptors, locations, which in segregated cities can tell you a lot about, um, uh, about the individuals involved. So we automatically redact it to um, something like this, where we preserve, for example, person identifiers across the narrative. We distinguish between um, black being used as a as a racial description and black being used as a as a color. Um, where again, I uh, automatically detecting neighborhoods and these other other features of the city. This is now being used by um, district attorney's offices in California when evaluating their their incoming cases. Um, now, one kind of note that I want to end on here: what is the point of this type of tool? Is to prevent what's legally called disparate treatment that we don't treat people differentially based on race or perception of race. That's what this tool is designed to do, but it doesn't combat disparate impact, meaning that our laws, even race neutral laws, could have disproportionate and unjustified impacts on communities of color. So, so drug laws are one popular example of this, where even if the law is applied uniformly in a race neutral manner, and, and that's not the case, but even if that were true, that wouldn't um, combat the problem that the law itself is, t is, is, is having a disproportionate burden, placing a disproportionate burden on certain communities. And so I just want to highlight the things that these types of tools can do and the types of interventions can help with and the things that they can't help with. Um, so now, just wrapping up, we saw that many popular algorithms it, in speech recognition being one example, exhibit these troubling disparities. Uh, many past attempts, and in fact, the kind of common conventional way of addressing these disparities is to take this deontological approach of demanding certain criteria hold either exactly or approximately. Um, I tried to sh highlight some of the shortcomings of that approach and, uh, and uh, propose an alternative consequentialist approach, which doesn't ignore these types of constraints that we might have a preference for, but also puts them in the context of consequences so that we can make informed trade-offs. And finally, um, I showed an example of a non-predictive algorithm that sidesteps many of the concerns I think are inherent to predictive algorithms. Thanks, everyone, for showing up and for, for uh, staying awake. <laughs>
uh, there, where the, the utility of, of the decision maker is some kind of aggregation of, of utilities of people? Yeah, so it's a good question. So there's always, in some sense, a social welfare function. Now the question is, what ingredients are going to go into it? You can just say my like, you know, my strict utilitarian approach only cares about um, uh, uh, parity, and then I'm going to break ties in some other way, like being on that Pareto frontier. So really, the the broad message is, if you are going to throw down these rules for what an algorithm should satisfy. And we saw many of these things when we were looking at this proposed legislation of demanding equal error rates or this intuition that I think a lot of us um, have about wanting to have like equal parity when we're, uh, uh, when we're allocating rideshare benefit is like understand that that is going to have downstream implications. And so yes, you can put that in saying there is a, there's a complex social welfare function that cares not only about these types of of uh, what are often formed as constraints, but also about the consequences. And then, you know, in that sense, we're just standard utilitarian argument. I'm trying to understand your part two and part three distinctions. Uh, maybe this is a simplistic summary, but is the, isn't the distinction between deontological and consequential approach in the objective function? There, are you, you're picking two different objective functions and you're saying perhaps that the second is better than the first? Yeah, so you can think of it that way. The fact that, you, so once you talk about an objective function, you're almost only a consequentialist. Just like it's kind of an empirical matter because you care about, you know, you're, you're, you're expressing an interest in outcomes. You know, you don't have to, like formally, you don't have to. You could say my objective function is only about error rates. My objective function is only about um, parity on some other dimension. But I would say once you use that language, you're probably already in this camp. Now, my critique is saying that the vast majority of papers, almost every paper, and I think there's probably a thousand plus papers that have been written in the computer science world at this point, start out, the first page is define fairness like this where this is let's have equal error rates, let's have demographic parity, you know, let's, not, let's prohibit the use of specific features in our algorithm, let's block off certain causal paths in designing an algorithm. All of those are rules that are completely agnostic to the outcome of implementing those strategies. So that is really this, this push. And it's funny, like in, in, it, it, in, and I think this is really a, a, a fact of the community of people that has developed this algorithmic approach, if these ideas developed in another community, I think the natural approach would have been one of consequentialism. It, it, it happened to be that this community favors these deontological notions. And even favors is probably a little bit too strong. I would say it's not that this was a well thought out argument and say, okay, let's consider these options and pick one. It was more like, here is something that doesn't seem crazy, and I don't think it is crazy, but it just went down this path where we now aren't making considered choices in many of these high stakes domains. Um, so I, I feel like the one of the main reasons why um, equalizing false positive rates seems like an intuitive definition of fairness, I feel like the main reason is that we subconsciously believe that the risk distribution should be the same between uh, these two groups. That's kind of what we're taught, right? Like, you know, everyone's kind of born equal, so therefore people should have the same risk distributions. And in that case, it would make sense that false positive rate or whatever, all, all these rates should be the same. Um, so like, but in some situations it's not the same, like maybe in this uh, risk distribution, uh, recidivism case. So like, maybe like the main thing we need to do is convince people or like in some situations they are different and we need to and we need to convince people that the risk distributions are different but maybe in some situations they're not different and in this case equalizing false positive rate is a reasonable thing to do yeah i think it's a really good point i think this is exactly what a lot of the intuition is from um well again i don't i don't know where this if i i, I suspect that that this is not actually the logic that is is going about i think for whatever reason we have a visceral reaction to error rates you know we've been thinking, and I, I try to highlight this with the ML example, I think we're just used to looking at the error rates, we see differences, we feel like there's a problem there. And the fact that we use the word error rate is just like triggering this thing in our brain that suggests that there's a problem. Now that being said, if risk distributions were the same, then we would, suggest, we would expect to see equal error rates. Now when we see differences in error rates, to me that suggests deep social inequities. 
Now, that the, what is the best way to fix those inequities? In some cases, it might be to kind of pretend like those inequities don't exist and then operate under that model where we equalize these error rates. In some cases, that might be a fine approach. In other cases, though, I think that could lead to even reinforcing inequities. And so this is really what, you know, you know, the point that I'm trying to make. That in some cases, error rates, like in the speech recognition example, we have strong reason to believe that these problems aren't inherently different. And so the fact that we see differences in performance suggests that we did something wrong. In other cases, we have strong reason to believe, you know, socioeconomic factors being one of them, that we would expect base rates to be different. If we expect base rates to be different, all of a sudden it becomes complicated to interpret error rates. Sorry. I think elaborating on that question, I almost feel like instead of like just comparing, like in, instead of just comparing the false positive rate of two groups, you almost have to condition on like comparable social economy or like covariates to start with in, in a sense, right? Can condition on similar type of like other other factors, non-protective factors between the two group and then you compare the relevant like false positive rate and they're the same people in a sense. So I think so I think it's it's kind of a good observation that that we want to adjust for other things. Now the nice thing about algorithms, which is is much harder in, in assessing human decisions, is we know exactly how it's functioning. And so here we don't need to look at error rates. We can look at the inferred distribution directly that's coming out of the algorithm. We know the decision process is a threshold in many of these cases, and so we can evaluate exactly how the system is working. We don't need to use these proxies. Now, if you look at these proxies, so in, in we do this in other work, that we've looked at these types of proxies in human decisions where you don't know what the underlying estimated risk was. We can't ask somebody to tell us what is their risk of some event happening, maybe in theory, but in practice, it's very difficult. And so we have to use these proxies. So this, in some sense, is why auditing algorithms is much easier than, uh, than auditing human decisions. <laughs> 